Hey guys, today we're talking about the Vietnam War, and I apologize if this is a long one. I love the Vietnam War, so I'm going to try and keep it to a reasonable length, but no promises. Um, so, a little bit of background about why America's involved in Vietnam to begin with. Vietnam used to be called French Indochina. They lost control during World War II, and they were seeking to regain control after um, U.S. occupation of uh, Japanese territorial holdings was over after World War II. But they end up losing all of Vietnam in 1954 in a huge battle that was mostly funded by the U.S. called the Battle Dien Bien Phu. Um, and when they lose control, Ho Chi Minh is a communist leader, um, in the North, um, and his followers are called the Viet Minh. And in the South, a new leader rises and his name is Go Dinh Diem. Um, so all of, all of this um, kind of comes to a head, this North versus South in 1954 in Geneva, the Geneva Conference, where there's an agreement reached to divide the country into North and South along the 17th parallel um, for two years until 1956. And then there would be a unifying election to elect a leader for the whole country. Um, Ho Chi Minh accepted based on the assurance that something would occur within the two years pretty um confident that he would be the elected leader and Eisenhower refuses to sign the Geneva agreement because of the domino theory. The domino theory is that if one country falls to communism, other surrounding countries might fall as well, one after the other, just like dominoes. So um, Eisenhower was afraid of losing Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, maybe even the whole country of India to communism if North and South were to be unified under Ho Chi Minh. Um, so what, what happened was a Vietnamese civil war. Um, the Go Dinh Diem regime was backed by the United States. Um, he's a terrible human. He's awful to everyone that is in Vietnam. Um, but he wasn't a communist. So the United States supported him. He was aloof. He was fiercely anti-communist. He was Catholic, ruling over a nation of mostly... Buddhist um, citizens, he canceled the 1956 elections, which seriously divided um, the country. The U.S. still supported him because they didn't want Ho Chi Minh to come to power, and all of Vietnam is just in disarray from being under colonial rule, being invaded, then this big civil war is going to break out. So there's actually huge opposition to um, Diem. There were people in the South, the Viet Cong, there's a political army of, um, they were called the National Liberation Front, was formed in South Vietnam. And these are people who support Ho Chi Minh in the South, the Viet Cong and the National Liberation Front. Um, are people that support communism in the South and the Viet Cong are kind of like the military arm of that. And they are, um, going to be the ones that the USSR and China kind of support because they're hoping to overthrow the South and make it a communist state. And so a civil war supported by China and the Soviet Union and eventually the United States starts raging. So the Vietnam War itself lasts 25 years across five different presidents, um, but the United States actually sends troops for a 10-year period, 1963 to 1973, so keep that in mind. So the first president that's kind of involved in Vietnam is uh, John Kennedy, and um, Kennedy had to choose between kind of abandoning Go Dien Diem, who's horrible, um, or deepening U.S. involvement. And we weren't sending troops per se, but we were sending these military advisors. And when I say the word advisor, I mean like they would train South Vietnamese troops. They were political strategists who would um, get intel, intelligence, and give it to the South Vietnamese government. So it's not U.S. troops, but it's very much U.S. involvement. And at this time, we only had 652 military advisors, and Kennedy raises that number to close to 16,000. And the hope is that that will strengthen the South Vietnamese army. Um, 
But because Godin Diem is really brutal towards a, a Buddhist majority, I mean, he's a rich Catholic and everyone that he's ruling over are poor Buddhist peasants. Um, there was lots of protest against him. He would eventually in 1963 be assassinated um, in a coup. And um, like the U.S., it's kind of like, a why would we support this guy? In fact, there were protests um, as violent as what I'm showing you right here, where Buddhist monks, um, this one specifically, set himself on fire to protest um, Godin Diem's regime. This is called self-emulation. It's a form of peaceful protest. Um, but photos of this showing up in American newspapers turns public opinion overnight against Godin Diem, who the American government had been saying, he's not communist. He's the one we want to rule. And then you see people lighting themselves on fire and saying, in protest of this man, and people are starting to question what the United States government um, is doing. And that's going to be the tone of the entire um, Vietnam. Nam War. Um, the American public will be questioning why is America even involved in this. So when JFK is um, assassinated, like the question of whether or not he would have pulled out of Vietnam and just let it fall still remains unanswered today because LBJ takes over. Um, so Johnson's whole thing is I'm not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way that China went. And China went communism because Mao Zedong took over. So his big moves, he keeps lots of um, JFK's cabinet. The most important one in terms of Vietnam War is Robert McNamara. He's the Secretary of Defense, so he's in charge of the military. And he actually ended up claiming responsibility for the war in 1995 because a lot of his policies, his domino theory, anti-communist stuff is what led us to be continue to be involved in Vietnam. Johnson basically does not accept any settlement in Vietnam. He's not guaranteeing a non-communist government, but he's definitely not guaranteeing the U.S. is going to pull out. And then we've got this major event called the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which leads to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So early August um, 1964, Johnson, President, you can watch it on YouTube. President Johnson gets on TV and announced that a North Vietnamese torpedo boat had attacked two at two u.s destroyers in international waters on august 2nd and august 4th they had been in the coast of north vietnam not provoking anybody just patrolling in what is known as the gulf of tonkin and he says the words attacks were unprovoked congress he, he goes to congress and almost immediately congress unanimously passes the gulf of tonkin resolution which gives lbj authority to widen the war effort without a declaration of war it's a blank check. Here you go, President. Send as much military as you want, as much defense spending as you want. Send troops. We don't have to declare war. This is obviously a world emergency was kind of the idea. The issue is years later, at the time, that was like, okay, America's like, we need to do something. We were attacked unprovoked, okay? Um, but later on, it became known, um, it was in a leak in the Pentagon Papers that this was all a lie and that U.S. shoot ships weren't unprovoked. Um, the, the attack wasn't unprovoked. We were helping South Vietnamese um, commandos raid North Vietnamese islands. And so we were actually engaging in an act of war, helping with a South Vietnamese raid on North Vietnamese islands. And that's why they torpedoed two of our ships. Um, so when this comes out later, it's going to be, again, the tide of public opinion kind of turning away from the war. Um, Johnson ordered limited retaliatory air raid against North Vietnamese air bases, um, but he will widen the war um, pretty significantly after this incident, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So... <sighs> As the situation unraveled, um, the initial objective of the South Vietnamese stabilizing and just becoming its own nation seemed to no longer be a thing. And as the U.S. got further and further involved, it was harder and harder to get out. And the military is, uh, uh, the situation is demanding more bombing and more escalation, send more advisors, send troops, send American troops. And everyone's saying domino theory, domino theory, domino theory. But once we start bombing these areas, it doesn't stop for years, years. Um, and the whole goal is to target the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So the Ho Chi Minh Trail is 
nope, never mind, I didn't put a picture, is um, a supply line trail from the North Vietnamese down to the Liberation Front and the Viet Cong in the South to supply them so that they can fight the South Vietnamese where they are. And Operation Rolling Thunder is this huge bombing campaign um, that LBJ uh, signs off on to attack the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a tangled network of dirt roads and muddy trails which soldiers and supplies flowed from North Vietnam, North Vietnam, down into South Vietnam through Cambodia and Laos. Um, and these raids and these bombings really, really failed to cut off the North Vietnamese um, aid to the South people who were fighting in the South. And South Vietnamese are suffering heavy losses from the very brutal Viet Cong fighters. So as you can see here, this cool little chart, and also the numbers over here, um, 1965, here we go, we're in a war, boom, 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 and we are sending thousands upon thousands upon thousands of U.S. troops to Vietnam, um, and the annual bill was more than $30 billion a year, so we are spending lots of money in this war. Um, one thing about the Viet Cong and the communists is much like, um, the fighting in, uh, in the Pacific against the Japanese during World War II is it's a different type of fighting. It's extremely, extremely brutal. This is jungle warfare. It's not straight lines here. We're meeting at a battlefield kind of war. It is little packs of men, search and destroy missions, bombings, um, defoliation. We'll get to that later. Um, Ho Chi Minh had warned the French um, that were still kind of involved on America's side. You can tell, kill 10 of my men to one of yours, but even at those odds, you will lose and I will win. So basically saying, I'm going to throw people at the problem and I'm going to win. So what does this um, war really look like? It's an air war. Um, airstrikes were preferred because it cost less U.S. lives, but at the expense of Vietnamese lives. Um, the U.S. had dropped more bombs on Vietnam than the Allies dropped during all of World War II, three years into the war. Um, not even three, one year into the war, really. Um, the Viet Cong dug, dug 30,000 miles of tunnels to ship supplies and escape bombing. So once they realized that we have found out their ho their supply line, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they're going to start digging tunnels so that the bombings do not impact them. Um, and the helicopter is widely used in Vietnam because of um, how, like, jungly it is. It's hard to clear out big airstrips for airplanes, so helicopters will do a lot of the air war tactics and medevacs and things like that. It's also a ground war. Search and destroy missions um, are the way to combat the guerrilla tactics of the Viet Cong. Um, and General Westmoreland, his, William Westmoreland is a famous Vietnam official, and he's constantly urging more U.S. troops, more U.S. troops. But finding the enemy was difficult. It's a huge jungle. Um, basically, like, if they don't lose, then they win. Because we're in, we're trying to invade them, and the U.S. by definition was just losing. It's dense, humid, hot, jungle terrain, um, and they reply uh, um, relied a lot on defoliation, which is um, trying to get rid of the jungle through heavy chemical firepower. Napalm is an incendiary, so it sets things on fire, and Agent Orange was a defoliant, meaning it's going to um, try and clear out the jungle, clear out the, the, the flora, um, the plants. Many South Vietnamese, once they realize America is bombing like indiscriminately everywhere, trying to get rid of these North Vietnamese, they turn against us because we're destroying their home. So America's kind of like, who's our enemy? There is this idea of pacification. Pacification programs were when villages were uprooted by U.S. troops and the people were moved to cities so that Viet Cong couldn't hide in these small little villages and we didn't know who to fight and who not to fight. <coughs> Keep in mind, friends, the average age of a U.S. soldier in Vietnam was 19 years old. The average age was 19 years old. So these are very young men that are performing these horrific acts um, of war. 
And um, so you're seeing pictures mostly of napalm. Napalm is the incendiary, and then Agent Orange is the defoliant. Um, and as you can see, this this top right picture is a very famous picture. This little girl who peeled off her clothes because they were burning her skin. She survived this, and she's given a lot of interviews and wrote a book about her experience as a Vietnamese child during the war. Um, so very um, interesting perspective there because she had nothing to do with the war. Her family, her village had nothing to do with the war, but it was in the way. Oh, here's that quote. If the guerrilla wins, if he does not lose, the conventional army, army loses if he does not win. Um, and Kissinger was an important U.S. official that we'll get to. So the next kind of wave of the war was in 1968. It was the Tet Offensive. So the Tet Offensive is kind of the big beginning of the end of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Um, many people, including the, that famous General William Westmoreland and other officials have been claiming the war's end was coming into view. It's going to come to an end. And people were kind of optimistic that the they were finding success in South Vietnam. They were going to be able to prop up South Vietnam. It wasn't going to fall into communism. We were going to withdraw our troops. Our men will come home. Okay. That was kind of the hope. And that hope is dashed to pieces on January 30th, 1968. Um, that is a Vietnamese holiday, the Tet Lunar New Year. And um, on this day, there was kind of like a temporary peace for the weekend um, because it was a both a North and South Vietnamese holiday. And so it was just assumed that there was not going to be major fighting. So the North Vietnamese put together this massive coordinated strike um, where close to 70,000 Viet Cong attack 100 different cities, same time on this um, Lunar New Year, um, ba military bases, embassies. Um, the offensive lasts about a month. Um, and there were thousands of casualties on both sides. And if, if you looked at the at the numbers, you would think, oh, well, the U.S. won because we killed more Vietnamese. But it wasn't it wasn't a win. It was we thought we were winning. We th but that's not exactly how we measure the scale of who won and who didn't. Um, because the fact that it was such a massive coordinate attack, it was kept a secret. They did it on a day when we didn't think there was going to be fighting. They basically won because they won the morale. It wasn't a military success, but it lowers American morale. It continues to turn public opinion away from the war instead of towards it. Um, because it's like we're not really winning this war is what the public is thinking. So this cartoon that you see here was actually printed in the Louisville Courier Journal in 1968 after the Tet Offensive. Um, and it's depicting Uncle Sam caught in this web that is Vietnam. And it says suspended here in Asia. We think back with chagrin. That means um, regret. How difficult the getting out. How easy getting in. Basically depicting that U.S. public opinion has turned against Vietnam. And it's difficult to get out. Um, um, but this is how we feel about it. So, of course, the Vietnam War garners criticism from the beginning, but it becomes most um, criticized after the Tet Offensive in 1968. And so this anti-war sentiment just kind of explodes. Um, part of the push for the anti-war sentiment is... Um, the New Left, which is a coalition of young people in this new political wave. A massive student protests begin focusing on the Vietnam War, um, such as Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, becomes a pretty militant like political group that um, college students can join. Some of them even kind of use more violent tactics, but a lot of Vietnam War protests were more peaceful. And the reason that students are leading this campaign is because students are the ones that are going to be most impacted from the Vietnam War because they're the ones that are going to get drafted. Um, the average age of a Vietnam War soldier is 19. Um, and we'll talk about determents, de um, deferments later. So um, the anti-Vietnam War sentiment kind of brings some people together, people that were civil rights activists, um, women's rights activists, anti-weaponry, anti-weaponry. Anti 
um, nuclear weapon activists, even some of the religious right kind of came in together and said, this is ridiculous, this Vietnam War. Um, and they used marches and funny signs and great slogans like I'm going to show you here in a minute. But one of the reasons that there's so much anti-war sentiment is the draft. And we're going to talk a lot about the draft um, in class. But it started out drafting about 5,000 men a month. And then it ended up to be close to 50,000 men per month in 1967. And before the draft was changed, it was changed to a lottery style draft, which we're going to simulate in class, which still messed up. Um people could easily get deferments basically if you had money. So the poor were twice as likely to serve and be drafted as the middle class or upper class until the lottery draft because of the types of deferments you could get for um, if you were in school, if you had a certain career or skill that would be useful to the war if you stayed at home. So um, it ends up being a lot of poor and a lot of minorities that are serving and many people call it um, a, a rich man's war but a poor man's fight is one of the um, slogans, anti-war slogans from the time. Some people dodge the draft and we've talked about draft dodging before but that term becomes a lot more prevalent during the Vietnam War. Um, some fled to Canada, some burnt their draft cards, some didn't show up. Um, many of them faced fines or jail time for doing that as well. So here's a um, slogan, an anti-war slogan from the time. Uh, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids have you killed today? Um, and then the next one is funny. Hell no, we won't go. And I love this picture because it's one of my friend's pictures um, from her project. She had her kids Photoshop themselves into Vietnam War posters and um, Vietnam War photos. So there's one of her students. <laughs> so um, we won't fight another rich man's war. Hell no, we won't go. Those were slogans that lots of people protesting the Vietnam War said um, and would protest with. So another reason that the war was so um, iconic and so um, prevalent was it was in the press. It was called the living room war because technology allowed the Vietnam War to be brought into America's living, ro living rooms via TV. And there was very little censorship of the press except for the things that the government keeps secret. We'll get to that. Uh, Walter Cronkite, who's the CBS Evening News um, anchor, the one that we watched in class that announced that JFK had died, same guy. Um, he, towards actually in 1968 after the Tet Offensive, goes on TV and he's kind of like the medium for the middle class in America. That's who they watch. That's who they get their news from. That's one of their celebrities. He says on TV, what the hell is going on? I thought we were winning the war. It seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience in Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. The only rational way out is to negotiate. And after hearing that on TV, um, President Johnson said, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, then it's over. I've lost Mr. Average Citizen. And he was right. Once the press turned against Vietnam um, and showed, like, as you can see, the Life magazine, the blunt reality of war in Vietnam, it was all over the place. The anti-war sentiment was much more deeply rooted in America. One of the reasons um, for that was the nightly body counts. Um, every night on the news, um, they would talk about how many Americans were dead and how many Americans were missing in action. And those numbers weren't accurate at the time because they didn't know um, for sure. But um, the nightly body counts really turned people against the war. Um, and when the government, when things started coming out about the government lying about the war, Americans stopped believing in the winnability of the war. Um, and public support in like kind of like Gallup polls at the time for the war um, was at 40% ish around the Tet Offensive and plunged down to 26% support of the war in those um, polls. So um, the there was a little divide there. Not everyone was anti-war. There were hawks and doves. So um, and this wasn't like people wouldn't go around and say like, I'm a hawk, I'm a dove, but anti-war protests, these sort of things were talked about in the news. So the hawks would be people who defended the president's policy. They believed in containment policy um, and that fighting communist infiltration was the United States job overseas. Um, a lot of radical right organizations were in this category. Um, 
Now, the dubs were the other side. They argued that the war was the Vietnamese Civil War. The U.S. should not have been involved. And they pointed to the body counts. They pointed to how domino theory, um, it's not America's job to protect the war, the world. And they also pointed to the economic cost of the war, um, not just the livelihood cost, but the economic cost. Um most Americans didn't fall into hawks or doves. Most Americans weren't radical, but almost all Americans were disturbed by the war and disturbed by the protests that they saw on TV and were thinking about it. And then the Tet Offensive happened and it changed public opinion drastically, drastically. So when Lyndon B. Johnson doesn't run um, in 19... Um, 19... 68, yeah, 68, um, and Nixon does, and Nixon wins, Nixon will take over Vietnam War policy, and here he is speaking on TV. So Johnson announces that he's not going to seek another term, and everyone's like, yep, that's right, because you would have lost. Um, he said, I have decided that I shall not seek and will not accept the nomination for my party for another term as your president. He knew that public opinion was very against him. So we get Robert Kennedy, who is um, going to be running as the Democrat, but then he's assassinated in 1968. And then Hubert Humphrey, who had been vice president. Um, and then Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon will win um, the election of 1968. Um, and Spiro Agnew will be his running mate, his vice president, and that will become important when we get to the whole Nixon Watergate scandal. So just remember Spiro Agnew is his vice president. Okay, so Nixon um, comes forth with this idea of Nixon doctrine, and this is just kind of ridiculous. In 1969, he pub publicly claimed that he had a secret plan to end the war. He did not. And the war continues for a lot longer after that. Um, but one of the things that he does, does put forth as sort of a foreign policy issue in Vietnam is the idea of Vietnamization. Um, and that is the idea of withdrawal of U.S. troops from South Vietnam over a period of time. The South Vietnamese would still receive U.S. money. They'd still receive our weapons. They'd still receive training from mili military advisors and advice from them so that the hope is that they would gradually take over completely and we could withdraw troops slowly and the fighting of the Viet Cong would be completely in the hands of the South Vietnamese Army and no longer U.S. And by 1973, he does reduce the number of U.S. soldiers. It was around half a million down to 25,000. But most Americans still disapprove of Vietnamization because it's not immediate and they want an immediate end to the war, not a slow withdrawal of troops. And they're going to dislike it even more when it is revealed that Nixon was actually secretly expanding the war by stepping up bombings and ground attacks in um, Cambodia and Laos. We've talked about the, the My Lai or the My Lai massacre, but let me go over it a little bit. Um, basically, in 1968, it was revealed to the public a year later that um, Lieutenant William Calley was ordered and carried out a massacre of 350 we think 350 civilians, mostly men, mostly women, children, and elderly. Um, he was supposed to go scope out this um, area in Vietnam, this village that was full of booby traps and always had problems and Viet Cong staying there. And there were no Viet Cong found, but they killed everyone in the village. Um, Callie claimed to follow direct order. He never really served time for his crimes um, and no none of the soldiers there that carried out these actions did but a letter was written by um, Rob Reidenhauer and that letter revealed and was printed later on um, what he heard had gone on there and so the U.S. finds out the public is enraged and protests kind of step up um, at home to end the war. While this is going on, there's a secret war going on. Same war, but Nixon is saying, we're, we're pulling out of Vietnam. We're bringing our soldiers home while secretly ordering a bombing of Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam in 1969. The purpose was to cut off those communist supply lines, Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it doesn't work. Um, and Americans don't know that he was saying, we're ending the war while also stepping up bombings until 1973. Um... 
he actually does go on TV in 1970 and say he's sending troops to Cambodia to clear out communists um, and to try and disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it would only be a 60-day thing. But when he goes on TV and announces that in 1970, um, protests kind of step up. And that's when the Kent State protest happens, this huge new wave of protests. So Kent State is May 3rd, 1970. It is students at Ohio's Kent State University protest. They burn down the ROTC building. I mean, it's not a super peaceful protest here. Um, The National Guard fires into the crowd and it's unknown whether they were told to or whether it was an accident and they just started firing but four were killed and of those four they weren't even really protesters they were innocent bystanders and 11 of them were wounded as well there were other um, college protests remember the bulk of this is happening on college campuses because they're the ones that are going to be impacted the most. So the Jackson State incident in May 1970 is um, at a black school in Mississippi, an all-black school in Mississippi. It's a week after Kent State. There's rioting in downtown Jackson, Mississippi. It prompted the National Guard to be called out. Two are killed, 12 are wounded, and those that died were innocent bystanders as well. Some um, colleges were closed down by student strikes like several hundred of them. Um, even because of the response, the the police brutality kind of response to these protests, even moderate people that weren't protesting kind of start to get involved in these protests because of just the mass hysteria over the war that's going on. Um, and then Congress repeals the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and kind of like a chronological event here that had given the president power, like an unlimited power. And then the Pentagon Papers are revealed in 1971. A defense analyst, Daniel Ellsberg, leaked government documents that he had access to in regards to the war effort during the Johnson years. And it basically um, was a timeline. It traced the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. They were classified documents that revealed that the government had misled Congress Um, And the American people, like the executive branch had misled Congress and the American people um, regarding their intentions, Um, that it wasn't all about eliminating communism. It wasn't domino theory. It was, we need to avoid being humiliated. We're this far in, we have to win now. It wasn't about helping the South Vietnamese anymore. And within this, the Gulf of Tonkin truth was revealed that It wasn't an unprovoked attack, but in fact, we were helping um, stage an invasion. And the, uh, the White House actually tried to block the publication of this in the New York Times, and the Supreme Court overruled Nixon, saying freedom of the press. And it was revealed to people, and people read snippets of it and realized the government had been lying to them about the war and um, the involvement in Vietnam and the reasons behind it. And the government's credibility received another heavy blow. And this is what we call the credibility gap, the gap between us being able to trust our government because they're elected leaders and the actual lying behind it. Here's some pictures from the Kent State protest. All right, we're going to skip that. So um, how do we end this war? The South Vietnamese just couldn't do it. Um, the They couldn't defeat the communists despite billions of dollars in training money and advisors and us being over there. American forces were withdrawn from Cambodia in 1972, but increased bombing. Um, the North Vietnamese were basically bursting through the DMZ, the line between the demilitarized zone separating the two Vietnams. We try more bombing and it just doesn't work. So we try to open up these Paris peace talks um, in 1972. The idea is that the North Vietnamese troops would be allowed to remain in South Vietnam, but will not try and overthrow the government. The draft agreement of this would include a ceasefire, we're going to stop fighting, um, return American prisoners of war, and the U.S. would withdraw from influence in South Vietnam. And Nixon kind of keeps pushing this, keeps pushing this, because he wants to win an election in 1972. He actually says, peace is at hand. Actually, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger says that. Peace is at hand, but the settlement kind of falls apart. And what does Nixon do? He orders what's known as the Christmas bombings. Um, 
And so the Christmas bombings, sorry, are um, on North Vietnamese cities, Hano and Haiphong, and they are 24-7 intense bombings, um, the most massive bombing of the war, basically to pressure the um, North Vietnamese to come to the table and talk about peace talks again. And it works. In 1973, the North Vietnamese return to the bargaining table and agree to the same deal that was on the prior side, um, where they still are allowed to control large por portions of the South. U.S. prisoners of war would be released. And after those prisoners of war would be released, um, the U.S. would withdraw forces. Nixon calls this peace with honor. And, but critics say this, we could have come to this agreement a lot earlier in 1968 when Nixon came to power um, four years earlier. So it's, yes, it's the end, but it's like this could have been done a lot earlier, a lot sooner. So fa flash forward to U.S. troops are not super involved, but there's still U.S. embassies there. Um, and there are troops at the embassies, protecting the embassy, but not really protecting South Vietnamese people. And the North Vietnamese have completely conquered, and they're heading for Saigon, which is the capital on the very bottom of the peninsula. Um, the South Vietnamese um, surrender to the to North Vietnam. They take over Saigon and rename it Ho Chi Minh City. And the U.S. ambassadors and even some Vietnamese that were considered high risk were airlifted out of Saigon to a, um, a fleet of Navy ships offshore in like a very scary moment that just shows us it's the end of the war. The war ended before, but we are not welcome in Vietnam. So it's it's it was a scary moment for U.S. citizens living in Vietnam and also for Vietnamese, South Vietnamese um, so here is part of those airlifts, um, helicopter after helicopter was landing, taking, landing, taking, landing, taking, um, U.S. officials first, then U.S. troops, then some Vietnamese that they considered high risk to be taken out. Here are literally South Vietnamese citizens clawing at the gates of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon saying, take me with you. Um, and many of them were left behind, obviously. Well, a lot of South Vietnamese, but, um, a lot of people that, had helped the U.S. government and would be in danger under the communist regime. Um, and Saigon fell, and it is it was called Ho Chi Minh City. So what's the overall cost of the war? We have 58,000 dead Americans, 300,000 wounded, and many missing in action, almost 3,000 missing in action. Two million Vietnamese died. Um, two million in their civil war that the U.S. got involved in. And I would venture a guess that those numbers would be less if the U.S. had not been involved. The U.S. spent over, oh, that's supposed to say billion, $150 billion, sorry, on um, the war effort. And just think those, that money could have been going towards Johnson's Great Society um, and social programs in the U.S., but it didn't. A large percentage of the United States people came to distrust their government because of the Cambodia bombings, because of the Pentagon Papers, the Gulf of Tonkin, the My Lai Massacre, the credibility gap, um, the police brutality when it came to protests. And um, that will get even more worse with the Watergate scandal. And then let's talk about soldiers. Um, those soldiers come home, Vietnam soldiers that had been drafted or had volunteered and they necessarily didn't believe in what the government and what the army was doing. They were just doing their job, but they are disrespected when they come home. There's no parades. There's no cheers. It's people spat on and said mean and nasty things to Vietnam War vets as if it were their fault when they got home. And many of those soldiers experienced horrible PTSD because of the war and then also their experiences when they got home. They were just not a um, respected group of individuals because of the war that they fought in, even though that wasn't their fault. So long-term effects here. Um, in 1973, the draft was abolished. We no longer have an active draft. Now young men still, when they turn 18, have to um, 
register for the selective service, but there has not been a draft called since 1973 when the war ended. The 26th Amendment was passed and ratified in 1971 during all of this, and it lowered the voting age from 21, when it had been previously, to 18. And the idea was some of these Vietnam War vets came home and they still couldn't vote because they weren't 21 yet. So that changed that law. Um, and then it, the War Powers Act was passed as well. The War Powers Act limits the president's right to send troops. So it basically repeals the Gulf of Tonkin resolution saying that the president actually has to ask Congress to declare war or he only has limited power. Um, sending troops for 60 day periods and getting giving them 30 days to return back home. Um, and then there's like a cooling down period, a waiting period before that can happen again. So that kind of takes away the Gulf of Tonkin, the blank check kind of thing. And in 1995, July 11th, President Clinton formally recognized Vietnam um, as a country and um, formally recognized that the war happened there and that the U.S. was involved, essentially kind of an interesting end to a war there. All right.